Matthew chapter 13. We're going to begin this afternoon at verse 1 and read through verse number 9. Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. The King James text today reads as follows. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear? Let him hear. Amen. I'm asking the question this afternoon. Where do you fall? Amen. Where do you fall? If you bow your heads with me a moment. I'm going to have to take my jacket off. I'm getting overheated. Amen. Let's pray as we begin the message this afternoon. Master, Savior, soon coming King. Redeemer and lover of lost mankind, we thank you, God, today for the presence of the Lord in the house of God. And while not everyone is able to be in this room, not able to be in this meeting place today, oh God, many are attempting to join us online. And we ask God today that the anointing and the presence and power of God that we have felt thus far in this service Lord, that it would not only be felt in this room, but that it would be felt throughout the nations, wherever this broadcast today might be reaching. And Lord, that every heart would enjoy the communion and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost that we're feeling even now. The Word of God today, O oh God, is broken. And Lord, we need to hear from heaven if ever we've needed to hear from the Lord. We sure do need to hear from him now. God, I ask that you would anoint this feeble man of clay. Help me, Lord, to perform this precious divine function, delivering the word of God in prophetic fashion, not merely getting up, Lord, and offering my own thoughts, my own opinions, my own feelings, but God being anointed and motivated inspired and set on fire by the Holy Ghost to deliver a message from heaven, not only for the hearing, but for the hearts of humanity. Those today, O oh God, who would have a desire to receive from your word, help us, Lord, to prepare our hearts and our minds to receive this word from God, that it might spring forth fruit unto righteousness and true holiness. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. The question that I ask today is, where do you fall? Jesus Christ our Lord was delivering a parable from the bow of a ship to a large group of people who had gathered. And in this parable he speaks of a sower scattering seed. And he speaks to the fact that when one scatters seed, there are any number of conditions which may exist. 
and uh, the conditions which exist obviously are going to affect the, excuse me one second here folks, I don't know why this stopped. Mm -hmm. Amen. Sorry about that. As the sower sows the seed, there are any number of conditions which may exist which affect how that seed is received and whether or not that seed is able to effectively take root and grow and develop into a plant that is capable of producing fruit and offering some benefit to that one who has sown it. I could go point by point today as I have often heard preachers do when this parable has been preached upon. Well, you know, there's this kind of ground and there's that kind of ground. But that's not quite the tact that I'll be taking this afternoon. And anyone who knows me knows that uh, I don't tend to do things just simply the way that they're done. Uh, but this afternoon I want to talk to us about the fact that as the sower, as the farmer goes out into his field. Now in ancient times, obviously they may have done things a little bit differently than we do today in the modern world. We're much more uh, scientific and specific in our approach to farming. We're much more careful about where we place our seed, how many seeds we place, how far apart each of the mounds may be. But in scriptural times, there was a certain practice where one would go out into his field after tilling it and preparing the soil to the best of their ability. And then they would simply go and scatter the seed. And there was kind of this mentality that, uh, you know, not all seed is going to take and not all the seed is going to grow. So they kind of relied upon luck, as it were, uh, that hopefully a good part of the seed will fall uh, not only on ground that has been tilled and not only on soil that has been torn up and broken up, but that that soil will be good soil and receptive soil and soil that will allow uh, the, the moisture from rain to be absorbed so that the seed might best benefit. But in the process of casting forth the seed, some of the seed would also fall just to the edge of the field that had been prepared. And it might fall just outside of the prepared ground. And there might be an area just outside of the boundary of the garden or just outside of the boundary of the field where uh, there, the ground was a little more stony, where the ground had a little bit more in the way of a uh, plant, uh, of plants and uh, of uh, thorns and uh, weeds that were growing up. But even some of that soil, I mean, excuse me, some of that seed that would fall outside of the prepared ground, even some of that seed would actually be able to find enough soil and enough moisture and enough sunlight to begin the process of germination. It would begin to grow. It would begin to develop. And then over the course of time, the conditions would overtake it. It was too thorny. There were too many weeds. There wasn't quite enough light. There wasn't enough moisture, there wasn't enough water in the soil to not only uh, to, to water the, the plant that had been planted, but also the weeds. And, you know, this is one reason why we don't want weeds in our garden and we don't want weeds in our lawn, because the weeds take away many of the nutrients and many of uh, much of the water that we otherwise need for the good things, you know, for the plants that we have planted. 
and for the grass that we do want to grow and we do want to develop. Uh, so therefore, we must remove that which is bad in order to allow that which is good to have more nutrition and more water and more moisture. Well, some of the seed that the uh, farmer in ancient times would cast out upon the ground would fall outside of the boundaries of the prepared field. And yet it still would be able somehow, some way to find the ability to sprout roots. Somehow, some way it would find the ability to tap into just enough moisture so that it would begin to grow. You know, a lot of times in the house of God, not everybody in the church is the child of God. Not everybody that's come to church today uh, by reason of the internet, not everybody that may tune in to us today uh, had any intention of tuning in. They didn't tune in as many of us have with the intention and with the thought and with the purpose of hearing from the Lord and receiving from God and therefore their heart the soil of their heart has not been prepared it has not been tilled it has not been cultivated to receive from God you see believers we come to the house of God with a purpose we come to the house of God with a hope that we're going to receive from the Lord that day. We're going to benefit from the Word of God that day. Our hearts are cultivated. They're prepared. They're made ready. But who has made our hearts ready? We have. We have. We have cultivated that ground. We have prepared that earth and made it ready to receive the Word of God. But oftentimes... There are young people who go to church with mom and dad. They're not there because they care anything in the world about what's going on. They're not there because they want to be in church. They'd rather be home watching a ball game. They'd rather be home uh, out in the backyard tossing around a frisbee or a football. They'd rather be any number of places than in the house of the Lord on a Sunday. Am I telling the truth? Many of you know exactly what I'm talking about because as kids, that's exactly where you were. You could have cared less about being where mom and dad had dragged you up and then on top of everything else to make it even worse, they forced you to wear that old starchy shirt and you had to wear your dress pants and you had to wear your nice shoes and by God, yeah, mom and dad not only have to drag me to church but they got to make me so uncomfortable while I'm here. Can't wear my jeans. Can't wear my sneakers. Can't have a t-shirt on. Well, of course, nowadays in the modern church world, you can come to church in your pajamas and everything's cool. Everything's great. <sighs> Back when I was a kid, you used to dress to go to church. You used to try to show the Lord some respect and you tried to honor God even before you left your house you were honoring and worshiping God by reason of the choices you made as you stood at your closet I still believe that way hate to tell you call me old fashioned all you want to but I still believe that way but many of us who have come to the house of God today we came with a heart that was ready we came with a heart that had already been tilled and cultivated so that the Word of God would have a welcome place, so that the Word of God would be able to fall upon good ground and that fruit would be able ultimately one day to be yielded from uh, the plant and the life that would spring forth within our hearts in response to the Word of God that we today would receive. But there are those that are in the church, husbands whose wives have dragged them, and they don't really care to be there. Kids whose parents have dragged them, but they don't really care to be there. Neighbors who have been henpecked to death 
by their neighbor. Why don't you come to church with me? Why don't you come to church? With me? And finally, they get so tired of it. They figure maybe if I just go this one time, I can shut her up or I can shut him up. People are oftentimes in the house of God. They are at that place where the seed of God's word is being scattered. But they have not come with a heart that is ready. They have not come with a heart that is cultivated and prepared to receive the word of God. And yet, Tommy, even though they've not come with a cultivated heart, a ready heart, they still wind up with one little seed of word that touches their heart. And somehow that one little seed is able to find just enough soil, just enough moisture, so that it begins to germinate and it begins to grow. The problem is not with whether or not the condition of our heart is able to allow the Word of God to germinate and allow the Word of God to begin you, to begin the process of growth, but whether or not our condition of our heart is such that the Word of God is going to be able to fully develop and come to that place where a full and complete and mature plant has grown and fruit is able to be gleaned from that plant. That's the real test. That's the real problem. Yeah, there are many people who come to the house of God and for a moment in time, the word of the Lord falls upon ground that for just a wee bit of time, it is able to germinate. It's able to take root. But eventually the weeds will overcome it. Eventually the stony ground will permit, will prevent the roots from growing any deeper so that the plant might tap into a deeper source of moisture and water and nutrition. And eventually that word that today inspired and encouraged and touched their heart, maybe today they believed for a moment the gospel of Christ. Maybe today for a moment they believed on Jesus, the Lamb of God, who had come to take away the sins of the world. Maybe today for a moment they had visited the altar and they had wept sincere tears of repentance at the altar. But unfortunately, they didn't come in to the house of God with the right conditioned soil. They didn't come in with the right uh, fertilizer. They didn't come in with the right level of moisture. They didn't come in with ground that was fully prepared and fully ready. You know, I think of David the psalmist. There was probably no man in the entire Word of God who was as human and as frail and as sinful and as faulty as was David. He began a shepherd boy doing his father's work in the fields caring for sheep and as time went on he became a strong and healthy young man. He became a warrior in the armies of Israel and ultimately rose to become king over Israel at the anointing of God. And David, for all that God had for him, for all the plans that God had for David, David was not perfect. Here I'm news for you today, children. For all of the plans that God has for you, for everything that God has for you to do, and everything the Lord wants you to accomplish, I got news for you. The fact that you are not perfect, the fact that you are not sinless and divine, is of no surprise to God whatsoever. I'm going to tell you something. Some of the greatest things that the Lord has ever done in the earth, He has done through some of the simplest, and most sinful of people. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? Amen. I'm not talking about sinful people 
who did not genuinely have a faith in God. David was sinful. David was full of faults and frailties. But David had a mind and a heart that longed after the God of Israel. David wanted more than anything in the world to do right, not only by his fellow citizens, not only by his subjects, but also by the God who, whom he served and whose he was. Don't give me this foolishness about God uses ungodly leaders to do godly things and all this crapola and point to a man named Donald J. Trump and tell me that, uh, oh, God uses ungodly men. No, no, God uses ungodly men. Yes, he does. The difference is ungodly men who genuinely have a heart that is after God. You see, just because you have a heart and a mind to live for God and to do right and to be right doesn't mean you necessarily have the ability to do that. The Word of God said oftentimes that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But David, the Word of God tells us that God himself spoke of David and said that David was a man after his own heart. God identified David as a man after his own heart. If there's anything David understood, Tommy, it is this. He understood that if the Word of God we're going to benefit his life and his walk with the Lord in any way, in any positive way. If the Word of God were going to accomplish anything good and beneficial in David's life, it was imperative that David's heart be right. Didn't matter if he failed. Didn't matter if he faltered. Didn't matter if he slipped. Or sinned, what mattered is that his heart always remain in a good place. That the soil of his soul and the soil of his heart always be cultivated. Always be properly nutritioned and properly watered. So that when that grain of seed of God's word fell upon his heart, it would have a welcoming place. David knew my heart is the soil in which the word of God is planted. And I need my heart always to be able to receive the word of God and to, to offer it a, a, a refuge and a place where it is welcome. That's why David said, create in me, O God, a clean heart. And renew a right spirit within me. You see, as children of God today, the word of God can fall upon our heart, but if our heart is not in a good place, if the soil of our heart has not been properly tilled and properly prepared, then the word of God is going to accomplish very little that's going to help us in our walk with God. And it's our responsibility. It's not our neighbor's responsibility. It's not the pastor's responsibility. It's not the preacher's responsibility. It's our responsibility to make certain that our soil is prepared, that our heart is ready to receive from the word of the Lord. Am I telling the truth today? How many people have we seen over the last Nearly 20 years that we've been in Dallas, Texas. How many people have we seen, Tommy, come into this church? And we've seen the Word of God take root in their life. And we've seen the Word of God, I mean, do some wonderful things in their life. And great things would begin to happen. Only for a period of time. Sometimes it would be months. Sometimes it would be years afterwards. All of a sudden we'd see... All that God began to do and all that the Lord was doing just began to shrivel up and die because the ground was stony. You can blame the pastor all you want to. You can blame the preacher all you want to, but honey, 
The Word of God tells us that God's Word, listen to me, will not return unto Him void. In other words, God's Word is going to accomplish positive and good things. The preacher can be the worst person on the planet, but if he's preaching the Word of God, that Word is still going to do great things in your life. It is still going to accomplish wonderful things in your life. It doesn't matter about the preacher is preaching it. What matters is that your heart be in a place to receive it, to be receptive of it, so that it can take root and grow. We've seen so many people come into this place, and after a period of time, months, years, all of a sudden, that plant begins to dry up. All of a sudden, it dies, and like an old dried up weed with no root, when a good strong wind comes, whoosh, there it goes, and it becomes nothing more than a weed blown in the wind. We've seen people over the course of time, and the birds have come, and they've stolen away the seedling, the sapling that's begun to, gr begun to grow. And all of a sudden, any progress that began to be made is lost. Why? Whose fault is it? It's because we have not prepared our soil. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I have never left a church in my life in a huff. Never happened. I've attended churches because I lived in communities where there was not a church handy to me that believed exactly the way I believed, you know. Now, for instance, they may have been a Pentecostal church, but they may not have been a holiness Pentecostal church. And uh, they didn't do things quite the way I believed. They, they didn't, you know, believe quite the way I believed. But, it, it, but there were similarities. There was common ground. And I would attend that church, and I was a member of that church. And I'm going to tell you a little secret. That pastor could count on me. That pastor could count on me to tithe. That pastor could count on me to be there every time the doors were open. If they had revival, I was there every night of the revival. If they had prayer meeting, I was there for prayer meeting. That pastor could count on me to be there, to be available to do what needed to be done, even though I didn't fully agree with their doctrine or I didn't fully agree with everything they taught or everything they said. And there were times the pastor would get up and he obviously would say things that I don't agree with. But this church was the closest to, to what I believed that was available to me, so I made a commitment to be there. And if I'm going to be there, by God, I'm going to be the best member they got. That's all there is to it. I'm not interested in stirring up strife. I'm not interested in stirring up trouble. I'm not interested in being a troublemaker. No, the Word of God tells me that God is not pleased with people who behave in that fashion. I'm not going to act like that. But do you know in all the years that I've been serving the Lord, I've attended all kinds of churches, I've never one time gotten mad at a pastor and stormed out the door. Have I gotten mad at the pastor? Oh yeah. Have I disagreed with something he said or something he did? Oh, yeah. Have I had the pastor rebuke me or chastise me and hurt my feelings? Oh, yeah. Got news for you. I dare say 98% of the time I deserved every lick I got. You see, if you're humble enough, if your heart is right with God enough, then you may not like to take a licking, but you'll go home and you'll think about it and you'll pray about it and you'll ask the Lord about it. And instead of sitting around justifying yourself in your bad conduct and in your bad behavior, you may very well find out that the Holy Ghost will inform you that the pastor was right. And I've had that happen on many occasions. So... I have never one time left a church in a huff. Never one time. If I moved on, it was for reasons that were good, sound, biblical, godly reasons. I found a church that believed more in keeping with what I believed, you know. And when I left, 
I never left on bad terms with a pastor. I still love that person. I still could communicate with that person. I'd still visit that church. I'd still be able to have fellowship with that pastor. You follow what I'm telling you today? You see, the problem oftentimes, my friend, is not with other people in the church. The problem oftentimes is not with other members of the church. The problem oftentimes is not with the pastor of the church. The problem oftentimes is with us. And where the seed of God's word has fallen. We've had people in this very church. And I'm going to tell you, I, I don't say this in a bragging way, but I'm going to be honest and, and just speak my heart. I don't think there are very many churches where you receive as balanced and as spiritual a diet as this church has offered for the last 19 years nearly in Dallas, Texas. I really don't. I say that neutrally. I'm not saying that as someone who's trying to toot his own horn. I'm saying that as a man of God, as a child of God, who watches our messages online and listens to our teaching online after we've put it on video and posted it. And Tommy, so many times I just sit back and I think, Lord, if it wasn't for the anointing of the Holy Ghost, if it wasn't for the wonderful operation of the gifts of the Spirit, if it wasn't for the way that the Spirit of God operates, I can't believe half the stuff that's come off this pulpit. I can't believe how wonderful it is. I wish I'd have had a church as a kid that offered the teaching and offered the preaching that this church is offered. And yet I've preached on things and taught on things and I've said things over and 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 over again. And we've had any number of people who wound up outside of this church, leaving this church in a huff, leaving this church in a fit of rage, or just leaving this church because they were tempted by something else that lured them away. And I sit back and I say to myself, Lord, where does the fault lie in this? Where, you know, I'm going to tell you, if, if I'm to blame for people losing out with God, I want to know about it. Because my job isn't to help you lose out with God. My, help, my job is to help you get in with God and, and stay under the spout where the glory comes out. And to walk in that place where blessing is prevalent. I, and I say, Lord, Am I to blame for this? Is there some fault in me for this? And oftentimes the Spirit of the Lord will speak back to me and say, Charles, how many times did you preach on this very subject? How many times did you offer teaching? How many times did you offer instruction on the very thing that caused that person to wind up leaving? How many times? Well, Lord, as I recall from the many messages I've watched and the, the Bible studies that I've taught, that I've looked at uh, I, many, many, many times, and the Lord spoken back to me and said, well, then where do you think the fault lies? Had their heart been cultivated, had the soil been good upon which the Word of God fell, are you hearing me today? Would they have done what they did? The problem is, Tommy, when I preached that a year ago, when I preached that seven years ago, when I preached that ten years ago, oh, they were there all right. They heard it all right. They shouted amen, brother, all right. They made themselves look as spiritual as they could look. But God doesn't look on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. And the truth of the matter is their heart was still stony. Their heart was still thorny. They still had things in their life and in their heart and in their mind that they didn't need to have. That they had not made the effort to remove. Does the fault lie with the pastor? No. I did my job. I did my job. I preached on it. I taught on it. 
I talked about it. I instructed on it. I did my part, but their heart was not in a place to receive it because if their heart had received it, listen to me, children, their life would have manifested it. Did you hear what I said now? If their heart had received it, their life would have manifested it. Well, what do you mean by that? Listen, if I plant seed in a planter outside in my backyard, how do I know whether or not that soil has received that seed? It's very easy. Eventually, I'm going to see the plant. How do I know if that planter's not only accepted the seed, but it has done so in a manner that is fully offering the nutrition and the proper moisture and the, the proper conditions that it ought to be offered? Because, Tommy, not only is the plant going to spring up, but it's going to grow, it's going to mature, it's going to fully develop, and what's going to happen eventually, it's going to either flower or fruit. Am I telling the truth? So if the seed is received, then the seed will be manifested. You can hear the preacher talk about forgiving one another. You can hear the preacher talk about uh, loving one another. You can hear the preacher talk about if you're offended by someone in the house of God, in the church of the living God, the word of God teaches you to go to them. Isn't that what I've taught on? How many times have I taught on that? And you're to go to them. You're to work it out. Never let things fester. Never leave things be for the enemy to work them up and cause them to become greater than they really are. How many times have I taught on that and preached on that? If your heart is prepared to receive it, then your life is going to manifest it. When you're in a place, folks, where you have received from the Word of God, when you're in a place where the pastor has been faithful to the uh, Spirit of God, the leadership of the Holy Ghost, when you're in a place where the ministry is truly scriptural and biblical, and you choose yet to act in a manner that is not keep in, not in keeping with Scripture, not in keeping with the mandate of God, then, honey, you can blame the pastor till your nose starts to bleed. The truth of the matter is, the fault lies with ourselves. Because had our heart been in a place to receive the ministry and the Word of God that had been sown all those years, then your life would have manifested it. If your life isn't manifesting it, something wasn't right to begin with. David said, Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. David knew that I need God's help if my heart is to be cultivated, if the soil of my soul is to be tilled. If the soil of my soul is to have the right nutrition and the right water levels, if conditions are to be positive and good so that I can receive the Word of God and not only receive it, but manifest it in my life, if those conditions are to exist, I need God's help. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? See, I'm not fool enough to think that in my own human efforts, I have the ability to prepare my heart and to make it what it ought to be so that the Word of God can benefit me as the Word of God ought to. In 1 Corinthians 3, chapter, uh, chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, the Word of God tells us, so then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. So he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. 
people love to blame the preacher. They love, oh my goodness, they love to blame the messenger. They love to say the pastor didn't do his job or her job. The preacher didn't do as they ought to have done. And when things in their life are not going as things in their life ought to go, they just love to try to blame the messenger. But the Word of God tells us that the messenger is only part of the process. The messenger, some plant, some water, but where does responsibility fall for whether or not that plant takes seed, takes plant, and takes root and grows? Where does the responsibility fall? It falls with God. It's some plant, some water, but God giveth the increase. Oh, so I got news for you then. If God gives the increase, then it might not be a bad idea to seek his assistance in making sure that my soil is ready to receive his word. Am I telling the truth? Do you ever notice that when I pray at the beginning of a sermon or the beginning of a message, now obviously I don't pray for you to hear me. I'm praying for the Lord to hear me. But do you ever notice that almost without fail I talk about Lord Prepare our hearts to receive the Word of God. Prepare our hearts. Do you know why we worship the Lord before we preach the Word of God? Do you know why we don't just come into the house of the Lord and open our Bibles and immediately begin to preach the Word of God or teach the Word of God? Do you know why we sing psalms? Do you know why we sing choruses? Do you know why we sing hymns? Because this helps us to get into a frame of mind. This helps us to get out of the turmoil and the trouble that we've been walking in out in the world all week long. This helps us to get into a better frame of mind and a better place. Why? So that the Word of God can take root. We're watering the soil before we scatter the seed. Hallelujah. We're putting down a little fertilizer. We're trying to make sure the soil has got proper nutrition before the seed is scattered. Hallelujah. You wonder why in Pentecostal churches the pastor prays. Not only at the beginning of the service do we pray, but then we also pray before the pastor preaches. Why? We've already prayed. Why do we have to pray again? Because when the Word of God goes forth, we must seek the assistance of the Lord. Because ultimately, He's the only one who can make this seed germinate. He's the only one who can make this seed take root and grow. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? So we go to God and we say, Lord, help us, God. Make us of a mind. Prepare the soil of our heart so that as the Word of God falls on it, it's falling upon good ground. I often use the phrase in prayer, Lord, that it might bring forth fruit unto righteousness. Don't you hear me often say that? What am I saying? I'm saying, Lord, don't just let this Word fall upon stony ground. Don't just let this word fall upon thorny ground. Don't let this word fall upon ground that is not properly cultivated and not properly prepared. But oh God, let it fall upon good ground so that it can not only take root, it can not only germinate, it can not only spring forth and demonstrate life, but it can fully mature and fully grow and ultimately manifest the fullness of everything that that seed promises. You look at a seed of corn. You look at a seed of grain. It's just this little tiny thing. It can look like it's going to look once it's been planted and once it's grown. But that little seed holds a lot of promise, doesn't it? Amen. You look at that seed, and in your mind, you're already picturing a stalk six or seven feet high with three or four ears of corn coming off of it. You've already got that corn 
husked and you've already got that buttered and you've already got some salt and pepper on it. I don't know about you, but right now I'm tasting that corn already. You've already, because that little seed is all about promise. So you don't want the seed. You want what the seed is able to produce. Am I telling the truth? When you plant flower seeds, you don't want seeds. <laughs> you want the flowers. You want what that seed promises. You don't want the seed. You want the manifestation of the seed. When you come to the house of God, child of God, you don't want the seed. You want what that seed is able to produce in your life. Hallelujah. You want what that seed promises. You want what that seed is able to to produce. You want what that seed is offering you. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You want that faith. You don't want the seed. Amen. Mm -hmm. Lord, I'm going to have troubles and struggles that come into my life down the road. I don't need a pocket full of seed. I need a pocket full of faith. I'm going to get hungry down the way. I don't need a pocket full of seed. I need a pocket full of fruit. I need a pocket full of vegetables. I need a pocket full of grain that I can then turn into bread or turn into pasta. In James chapter 1, almost done. Verses 19 through 22, James, the brother of Jesus, says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness, which is self-control, the engrafted word, the scattered seed, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word. Manifest what is being planted. And not hearers only. Don't just let the word fall. And don't let it just begin to take root. But be ye doers of the word. Let it perform its full function. Its full operation. Let it come into uh, completion and maturity. So that it might fully Demonstrate in your life what it promises. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Mm. My question today is this. Where do you fall? What category do you fall in? Is the condition of the soil of your heart thorny? Do you find that the preacher can preach until his face turns blue and he nearly drops dead with a heart attack and you walk out of the church and soon as you've left, little birdies come and steal away the seed that had just been planted? Do you find your heart is, is stony? Do you find there are too many weeds in your heart that you have failed to ask for God's assistance in pulling up by the root so they don't keep the moisture and they don't keep the um, minerals and vitamins and nutrition that the Word of God needs if it's to bear fruit in your life. Where do you fall? Because, honey, in the end, the Word of God is only going to benefit you if you have prepared your heart to receive it. Amen. Do you understand me today? The Word of God is only going to benefit you and I today if we have prepared our hearts to receive it. Amen.
with David the psalmist today I say, Create in me, O God, a clean heart, and renew a right spirit within me. What is a right spirit? A right spirit is a humble spirit. A right spirit is a spirit of meekness, so that we with meekness might receive the engrafted word of God. Father, we love you today, God, and we thank you for this opportunity to come into the house of the Lord. Jesus, you're wonderful. The word of God is wonderful. It's amazing, Lord, the strength that I feel even in my body as I stand to preach the word of God. Lord, there is strength, there is nourishment, there is encouragement and inspiration, there is hope in hopeless times that is offered to the people of God by reason of your word. You've declared, O oh God, that the people of God do not walk by sight, but we walk by faith. You've also declared, Lord, that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. O oh God, if we're to be able to succeed in this life, if we're to be able to overcome in this life, we must have faith. And our faith can only come when we allow the word of the Lord, the word of faith, to be received in good ground. Lord, when we nourish it, when we water it, when we give every opportunity for that word to be encouraged and nurtured and watered and fertilized. Master, today, oh God, we need you to create in us clean hearts. We need you, O oh God, to create in us a right spirit so that the word of God can be received, so that we as children of God can be receptive, so that one day we will not have a plant or a sapling, but we will have a mighty, fully grown, mature plant that's bearing fruit and offering nourishment to our soul. Father, I pray today, God, that this word would have been an encouragement and a help and inspiration to the people of God. Those who are watching now, those who will watch at a later date and time, oh God, let your word spring forth. Let it bring forth fruit unto righteousness for your name's sake. And Master, once again, as we close the service, I ask God that you would continue to bless Owen. Be an encouragement, God. Be a comfort at this horrible, difficult time to his family. Bless his wife, Naomi, oh God. She needs you, Jesus. Wrap your arms around her, Lord, and let her know that even at this difficult time, she is neither forgotten nor, Lord, is she unloved. The love of God is able today to embrace her. And Lord, we ask God that you would wrap your arms around her in the mighty name of Jesus. Give her victory. Give her deliverance. Oh God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, touch that boy in the name of Jesus. Touch him by your mighty hand. We ask all this today, oh God, in none other than the precious name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth the only begotten Son of the living God, Lamb of God, slain from the foundations of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God and amen. Thank you.